Um, okay. So for those of you who don't know, um, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm coming here to, to, to hear more about this new book uh, from Professor Bashevkin. Professor Bashevkin has written a whole whack of books. Um, I'm a scholar of Canadian politics, and I have to say, um, what's been really significant for folks in our subfield of, of political science has been um, that we we benefited from trailblazers like Sylvia. Sylvia, I'm sorry to make you put you on the spot. Um, I think for for lots of folks who have been interested in in themes or issues or areas that have been kind of marginal to the discipline. Uh, I think we're having a moment now with Indigenous studies that have become more central to the study of Canada. Um, the study of women, the study of gender, uh, was very much sidelined for a long time, and one of the first people to actually take that seriously um, and kick at the mainstream of, of the field is, uh, is Sylvia. So, really important for people like me and, and other scholars, but uh, but what's also really significant about, about Professor Bershevkin's work is how, uh, as a political scientist, Canadian politics, comparative politics, and now this new work uh, takes her into dipping her feet into the field of international relations. So uh, I'm really excited to, to hear about this work. Uh, you know she's a professor of Dep in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. If you're interested in other work, um, uh, oh God, you know, women on the defense. There are so many, so many books, but you can uh, you can look that look her up uh, on the website uh, of the university. Um, the new book uh, just released in September. Right? Yes, yeah. This month, yeah, I've there got flying with a discount. There you go. Uh, it's called Women as Foreign Policy Leaders, a comparative study of four American decision makers since the Reagan years, uh, published by Oxford University Press this fall. Uh, and another volume coming out on women premiers in the Canadian provinces and territories uh, from UBC Press. Is that your you're, you're primary editor of that book? Yes, yes, and that's due out in April. There you go. So, um, never a dull moment, uh, but I'm going to leave. Um, leave the floor to uh, Dr. Brzezewkin, and I think we'll have some time for, for questions as well. Welcome to the University of Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Arsini. I do want to pay tribute to a, a pioneer here at the University of Ottawa, Professor Carolyn Andrew, mm -hmm. who was a major inspiration for me as a young scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an honor to be here, and I wanted to um, ask what, what we know about women's participation in political executive roles. How useful are theories about gender and leadership uh, to research on women who hold contemporary foreign policy positions? And what types of methodologies seem best suited to the study of national security and feminist politics uh, among political executives? And what conclusions can we draw from the uh, available data? Uh, so in my talk today, I want to address each of these questions. I want to focus on four senior foreign policy decision makers who were appointed by American presidents since 1980. Uh, I will argue that in a field that has directed far more attention to elected legislators than to appointed members of the political executive, it's crucial to try to redress this imbalance in the academic literature, uh, particularly because a large volume of comparative research emphasizes the increasing concentration of power in the hands of the political executive. So I ask, why should we spend all our time only on, on legislators? Uh, in particular, I want to argue that we need to probe whether our understandings of gender politics that are drawn from the study of women legislators are applicable to members of national cabinets. So first, I'll suggest today uh, the idea that women elites are consensus seekers, predisposed towards a serene, non-conflictual, or what the political philosopher Jean Elstein calls a beautiful soul's approach to public leadership. I want to argue that that um, approach is directly challenged by close observation of foreign policy appointees in the United States. And I will argue that women appointees have been highly influential inside presidential administrations in ways that gen uh, demonstrate assertiveness and a sustained willingness to act assertively and aggressively on the international stage. In some instances, to, agree that, to a degree that's measurably more belligerent than many of the men with whom they serve. And these trends stand in direct contrast to the results of empirical research on women legislators. And that research shows that the presence of women in a parliament is inversely related to a country's likelihood uh, to use armed force. I want to signal, however, a point of clarification in terms of my argument. I will look at the track records of poor women, and I will show that they do have a shared willingness to practice this uh, assertive uh, activists often high-wire act on the world stage, 
But the data also reveal highly, di highly divergent personal backgrounds and worldviews, including differing perceptions of American interests and how best to defend those interests. So my core contention will be that despite disparate approaches to national security policy, each of these actors was a bold, adventurous appointee who, contrary to the predictions generated by the conventional understandings about women as leaders, they were far from averse to using force in international politics. Uh, second, given that we're here in Ottawa where uh, our country's um, foreign affairs uh, is decided, uh, in order to address the comparative dimension to the story, I want to argue that women appointees, like their male counterparts, tended to vary by party in their approach to American relations with uh, U.S. allies. The Republican leaders I'll look at were more unilateralist in their willingness for the United States to go it alone on the world stage, and they tended to dedicate limited energy toward building common ground, including with Canadian and European allies, inside international institutions. By contrast, the Democrats demonstrated a more multilateralist or liberal internationalist strategy that saw shared engagement with American allies as a crucial part of their diplomatic work. So what's interesting about this pattern is that once again, it reveals cracks in the assumption that the leadership styles and leadership content of women leaders are consistently oriented toward minimizing conflict and finding uh, points of compromise. A third, in terms of representing feminist interests, I want to uh, present data today that show women in senior foreign policy positions demonstrated varied understandings of groups and group legitimacy. The two Republican appointees that we'll examine are considered in the uh, traditional literature to be failed representatives uh, with respect to the claims of progressive feminism. But I want to propose an alternative reading that suggests that their approaches to women's rights resonated closely with important elements of American public opinion. So in this sense, conservative women, I argue, can be normatively good, small d democratic representatives uh, in their elite positions. So let's turn for a moment to the scholarly literature, where we know women's legislative participation has long dominated the research agenda. To the extent that researchers have probed involvement in the political executive, they conclude the following. First, proportions of women presidents, prime ministers, and cabinet ministers have for the most part risen over time, but they continue to vary widely across countries, uh, parallel with trends that show women's generally rising but still highly variable numbers in parliament. Second, the data show women who attain cabinet office are more likely to be assigned portfolios that the literature considers soft or lower prestige uh, than what are considered to be the sort of hard or higher prestige uh, portfolios uh, that are uh, assigned to men. So this is usually women clustered in social or cultural portfolios and men in finance minister jobs or foreign minister jobs. Now we know much less about uh, the consequences of women's presence in executive office. One set of the propositions that relates to this area uh, follows from the literature on women as consensus seekers. And this originates, of course, in the conception of women as pacifist souls, and that dates from classical philosophy. We know that women, like slaves, were not considered full citizens of the ancient Greek um, polity, and women's sphere was defined as this motherly, uh, sorry, motherly nurturing space of the private household, which is described as a quiet refuge, neatly separated from the rowdy public forum in which men are going to debate and resolve uh, civic issues. So the public-private split we know helped to create this binary divide in political theory as well as in civic practice and that imputed specific qualities to each side of this binary division. Not surprisingly, classical philosophers elevated the importance of the public domain because that's where we saw strong, articulate men advancing their positions on matters of general consequence and in some cases they're exchanging physical blows in order to defend their perspectives. Uh, women's uh, role, of course, is considered weaker in most respects. It's considered inferior to that of men. But its grounding in self-sacrifice and care for other people yields some compensation, which is namely a persistent association of the private sphere with serenity and caring and moral virtue. So this idea that women were innately peaceful beings proves extremely durable over the centuries. 
If we look in the late medieval period, we see the work of Christine de Pizan, who's among the most prolific European writers of that era, who remarks on what she calls, and I quote, the pacifying potential of the good princess, given that women who are physically weak and timid are therefore more inclined to make peace and avert wars, end of quote. If we look at Jean Elstein, a post-war American political philosopher, we see the argument that well, uh, Western thinkers dating from the 18th century built on these classical and early modern precedents by assigning to women a collective image that Elstein calls that of the beautiful soul. And framing women as apolitical creatures defined by little more than a pure and innocent maternal identity means that political theorists could conceive an effect of a partial citizen best typified the, by the Madonna of Renaissance portraits. She's calm, modest, life-giving. And by comparison, men are presented as society's bellicose combatants, what Elstein calls the just warriors, who would typically end life rather than offer life. And Elstein argues that this cultural legacy continues to shape our understandings of peace and conflict long after the passing of classical Greece. Uh, the use of force in crisis situations, which we know constitutes a major policy option for decision makers and for the citizens whom they represent, thus remains closely linked, not to women, but rather to men. So we know from a leading international text by Jill Staines, and I quote, if historically war has been associated with men and masculinity, peace has long historical associations with women and the feminine, end of quote. Above all, this argument that women carry particular moral predilections that will reduce the probability of international conflict uh, permeates a number of influential academic texts. And some of you may have heard of the classic book from 1982 called In a Different Voice by the psychologist uh, Carol Gilligan. Uh, it posits that girls grow up with an understanding of strength as emanating from interpersonal ties and in particular from showing emotional care and concern towards other people. And this socialization process uh, means uh, expectations that um, women will behave in ways that elevate the value of nurturing and protecting life, um, that this shapes their lives um, uh, for long periods. Uh, by comparison, the socialization of boys, according to Gilligan, um, means that uh, there's typically a stress on individual autonomy and physical prowess. And this masculine background uh, not only permits, according to Gillen, Gilligan, but also justifies the use of force to defend self and community. Now, more recently, some similar ideas, not exactly those of Gilligan, but similar, uh, appeared in a 2011 book uh, called The Better Angels of Our Nature by a psychologist named Steven Pinker. And that 2011 book asserts that increasing numbers of women leaders will make the world a more serene place. He grounds this claim in concepts of maternal protection, and in particular, a view that holding motherly roles throughout human history has encouraged females to favor calm and stable conditions in which to nurture the next generation. And Pinker maintains there are clear incentives that have led women to avoid the alternative path because it's an evolutionary dead end of seeing sons and daughters either traumatized or wounded or killed in war. We know there are many accounts in the popular media that help to highlight uh, this disjuncture uh, between our expectations concerning what women will do in times of international crisis on one side and the actual policies they have championed on the other. Uh, here's an edition of, of Time magazine from the middle of May 1999, and it provides a telling illustration of this tension. The cover photograph from that edition of Time magazine shows an intently focused American Secretary of State speaking on a field telephone from a NATO military base in Germany. The Secretary wears a brown leather flak jacket with a bold insignia of US Air Forces in Europe. And underneath it spills a headline in cautionary yellow type, all bright at war. The opening section of the lead story by Walter Isaacson signals a visceral discomfort with Albright's <coughs> leadership role in wartime, and thus reinforces the imagery on the magazine's cover. And I'll quote briefly from uh, Isaacson. 
The Kosovo conflict is often referred to by both her foes and fans as Madeline's War. In a literal sense, of course, that's not true these days. Now that it's become an armed conflict, she plays a supporting role to the President, National Security Advisor Sandy Berger, Defense Secretary Bill Cohen, and the military brass. But more than anyone else, she embodies the foreign policy vision that pushed these men into this war. And she is the one most responsible for holding the Allies and the administration firm in pursuit of victory." End of quote. For readers of Time Magazine, <coughs> the alluring hook in this narrative was strikingly obvious. How could one woman cause so many powerful men to go to war in an obscure corner of Central Europe? And for us as scholars, the deeper puzzles are even more fascinating. What explains the profound unease that Albright's role uh, created, which permeates this account? How did her forceful pursuit of NATO intervention in the Balkans, to, on two occasions during the Clinton years, compare with the actions of other women decision makers? And those questions permit us to move beyond the details of any one crisis in order to consider a group of women and a group of decisions. So fortunately for me as a researcher, the arrival of multiple firsts for women in top diplomatic positions over the past 35 years uh, has provided an unusually promising research opportunity. A succession of women appointees in senior foreign policy jobs um, has occurred in a single country, meaning scholars can now control for variation within systems and they no longer need to compare across vastly divergent countries as was the case in earlier studies. For example, earlier studies of Indira Gandhi and Golda Meir and Margaret Thatcher, very different leaders in different systems. Moreover, these career trajectories unfolded during an era when the US held superpower dominance, when the scope of international action available to American leaders was wide, and in particular, when the choice to invoke military force, whether multilaterally or unilaterally, uh, constituted a key foreign policy option. I've examined uh, some northern European countries, such as Sweden and Finland and Norway, and that material provides valuable comparative insights, since we've seen multiple women reach senior foreign policy posts in the Nordic region. Yet, in those uh, northern European countries, decision makers rarely pursue armed intervention, and even more rarely, uh, do their countries enter wars outside a larger coalition. So let's look at the four American women. Who are they? Well, the first was Jean Kirkpatrick, the first woman to represent the United States at the United Nations. She served as a member of Ronald Reagan's first administration during the twilight years of the Cold War. The second, Madeleine Albright, held the UN ambassadorship and became the first woman Secretary of State during the Clinton administration, shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The third is Condoleezza Rice, shown here with President George W. Bush. She was the first woman to hold the position of U.S. National Security Advisor, and she was the first African-American woman to become Secretary of State. And she served President Bush in the period um, of the attacks of 9-11 and the subsequent invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. Finally, Hillary Rodham Clinton, the first to move from first lady to elected politician to America's chief diplomat. And we know that she may faced major regime changes in the Arab world, as well as China's rise to global prominence during the initial um, mandate of President Obama. So today I will use an approach that's inductive and qualitative and ethnographic. I use data drawn from published accounts on the public record including news stories, memoirs, biographies, and secondary analyses. And these sources permit us to respond to three main questions about women decision makers. First, were their actions in office consistent with theories about women as seekers of consensus and avoiders of conflict? Second, what can be said about the comparative politics dimension of their foreign policy leadership? And third, how did these women leaders act with respect to women as a group interest? So let's begin with the first question. It's difficult to discern pacifist angel characteristics in the track record of Jean uh, Kirkpatrick 
as UN ambassador during the first Reagan administration. At that time, Kirkpatrick directed her energies toward overhauling the international organization known as the United Nations under the threat of a full withdrawal of American dues to the UN. Before she was appointed to that post, Kirkpatrick was a conservative Democrat with a capital D, and she published a powerful indictment of American inaction during the Carter era. It came out in Commentary magazine, and it made Kirkpatrick extremely prominent as a neoconservative uh, public intellectual. Her dissection of how the United States was caught off guard by both the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the taking of U.S. hostages in Iran led to an invitation to join Ronald Reagan's team. And many of the key foreign policy directions of the first administration, I argue, were laid out in that article that Kirkpatrick published in Commentary Magazine in 1979, which in turn brought her to the attention of Reagan's advisors and then Reagan himself. Once she was in office, Ambassador Kirkpatrick showed little willingness to champion what we could call soft or consensus-based approaches to international relations. She endorsed, for instance, channeling proceeds from arms sales to Iran to the Contras of Central America. One of her colleagues later told Congress in the Iran-Contra hearings that he should, have he should have opposed that plan, but he feared being called out, and I quote, as some kind of commie, short for communist, uh, end of quote, by Kirkpatrick and others. As a committed Cold Warrior, Jean Kirkpatrick worked to marginalize the Soviet Union and its allies at every possible turn, and she insisted that the United States needed to reward its friends and neighbors, even if those allies were repressive, were repressive military regimes in Latin America. Second, if we turn to Madeleine Albright, we see that she served as UN ambassador, then Secretary of State in the 1990s under a Democratic president. Now, Albright clearly differed from Kirkpatrick and other Republican appointees in that Albright supported multilateral and humanitarian approaches to foreign policy. Yet there is sustained evidence that I, I present in my book that Albright advocated a more muscular foreign policy than many of the men in President Bill Clinton's cabinets. For example, General Colin Powell recalls in his memoirs how Albright challenged him directly at one White House briefing about Bosnia. Why, Albright asked, did Powell's presentations always conclude with the same dismal prognosis? U.S. forces could not release the Serb blockade of Sarajevo without committing large numbers of troops and major sums of money, which would ultimately lead to another Vietnam-style quagmire. Colin Powell writes that Albright's questions nearly caused him an aneurysm, but history shows that she won the debate. NATO troops intervened first in Bosnia and later on in Kosovo. Each of these actions became a major part of the Clinton foreign policy legacy, and that suggests that just as Kirkpatrick's influence was clear in the Reagan administration, uh, decision-making of the early 1980s, so too was Albright central to the Democratic uh, political executives of the 1990s. The third uh, woman to reach these top ranks was Condoleezza Rice, initially National Security Advisor to George W. Bush and then his Secretary of State. Like Jean Kirkpatrick, Rice raised her profile as a foreign policy advisor by publishing a very harsh critique of the previous Democratic administration. Rice condemned the Clinton team for lacking the focus and discipline necessary to pursue a strategic approach to world politics. She maintained that misguided efforts to seek international consensus and operate through multilateral institutions ignore the core aim of American foreign policy, which is to promote national interest. We know that Rice was exceptionally close with the Bush family and with George W. in particular. She was the first to speak with him following the initial attack of 9-11. Rice recommended the critical statement in Bush's address from the Oval Office on the evening of 9-11, which said, and I quote, we will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them, end of quote. She worked on crafting and communicating other pivots for what became known as the Bush foreign policy doctrine, namely the preemption argument that said that waiting for groups like Al-Qaeda to attack the American heartland uh, was not an option. Rice's successor as Secretary of State was Hillary Clinton, an outspoken advocate 
for the NATO-led operation in Libya. We know Clinton traveled extensively in early 2011 at the request of President Obama. Um, and here she is with the Gulf Cooperation Council in Qatar. Uh, she reported that demands by Libyan opposition groups for a UN-sanctioned no-fly zone were gaining support within the Arab League as well as within the Persian Gulf Cooperation Council. She argued within the administration for a UN resolution that authorized all necessary means to defend civilians in Libya. When uh, President Obama's National Security Council convened in March of 2011 to debate military intervention in Libya, the opponents of U.S. involvement included the Defense Secretary, the Vice President, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Clinton made a strong case in favor of intervention by telephone from Cairo, and she argued that the U.S. needed to act in a way that connoted international leadership rather than indecision and waffling and inaction. Clinton's view was supported by the administration's ambassador to the UN, Susan Rice. Later that day, we know President Obama reviewed detailed military plans for intervention in Libya, and his decision choices were either no action, enforcement of a no-fly zone, or all necessary measures. And he endorsed the third choice that had been championed by Clinton, and that led by the fall of 2011 uh, to the uh, end of Gaddafi's regime. And, um, Secretary of State uh, Clinton uh, visited Tripoli that same autumn. Now this brief overview points toward important variations across these four women policy leaders, but also towards one significant commonality. In terms of differences, the Republican appointees, Kirkpatrick and Rice, tended towards a unilateralist view that the United States could take action successfully on its own without constraints imposed by working in a coalition. Uh, or with multilateral institutions. By contrast, the Democratic appointees, Albright and Clinton, were more multilateralist in that they pressed um, for NATO uh, to take on three path-breaking military actions uh, that occurred in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Libya. My key point, however, is a bipartisan one. Women who have ascended to foreign policy leadership in the U.S. stand out as bold and transformative decision makers whose contributions have molded international politics in measurable ways. Each interpreted national security in an assertive, muscular way that would be inconsistent with views of women leaders as consensus seekers who avoid the use of force. And these same results stand in direct contrast uh, to comparative findings about women legislators. Now what can we say about the specifically um, comparative and partisan dimensions of these women's contributions? Let's begin with a track record of Kirkpatrick who made it abundantly clear when she was U.S. ambassador to the U.N. that the actions of European governments were often misguided in the extreme. In the first months of her term, Kirkpatrick analyzed voting patterns in the General Assembly, and she found that coalitions of Arab, African, Soviet-aligned, and ostensibly non-aligned countries formed blocs whose members were unwilling to criticize each other. And she maintained that America's allies failed to rebut charges of neocolonialism, and she described the UN delegates from Europe as accepting, and I quote, of their prescribed role, grown accustomed to being it in a global game of dump the clown, and have opted to understand the point of view of their third world accusers, end of quote. This tendency towards dismissive views of American allies can be discerned as well in the track record of Condoleezza Rice as national security advisor in the first Bush administration. She's here with the um, Israeli uh, Foreign Minister, Zippy Livni. When the United States sought UN Security Council support for a resolution to authorize war against Iraq in 2003, we know that Britain, Spain, and Bulgaria were on side with the US, but France, Germany, and Russia were opposed. And the French Foreign Minister was particularly outspoken in his criticisms. A European public opinion was generally opposed as well. And Rice suggested to Bush that after the war was over, the U.S. should, and I quote, punish France, ignore Germany, and forgive Russia, end of quote. And it's worth recalling that France and Germany were ostensibly close American allies in 2003. Now these approaches by Republican decision makers stand in sharp <coughs> contrast to those of Albright and Clinton, who were Democratic appointees. Here we see Albright descending in a Stetson hat reminiscent of her adolescence in Denver, Colorado. We know that Albright devoted enormous attention to uh, trying to reconcile divergent European positions 
and advance of the NATO interventions in the former Yugoslavia. We know that Clinton did the same with respect to NATO action in Libya. And each of these, uh, here we see, uh, here we see Clinton with uh, Obama's team watching the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound. Each Democratic leader writes in her memoirs about the need to repair frayed relations with American allies in the wake of Republican administrations that were simply less interested in multilateral cooperation. Hillary Clinton notes in her autobiography that these divergent histories held measurable consequences. She points out that between 2000 and 2008, positive views of the United States had plummeted. This is while well, George W. Bush is president. Plummeted positive views of the US from 83 to 53 percent in Britain, from 78 to 31 percent in Germany. So in short, these women foreign policy leaders have resembled men in the same position. That is, they have tended to vary by party in their approach to relations with American allies. Republicans have tended toward unilateralism and Democrats towards multilateralism. Uh, but in no case have these women elites been pacifist angels uh, who sought compromise at any cost or who rejected outright uh, the use of force. So let's turn our attention now to gender representation questions. Uh, what were the practices of these national security uh, leaders? And here we find that consistent with research on US state uh, legislators and members of Congress, uh, these foreign policy leaders differed along party lines. The Democratic appointees were more engaged in substantive pro-equality activities than their Republican counterparts. So for example, here we see Albright at the UN, during the 1990s, Albright created networks of women UN ambassadors and networks of women foreign ministers. She used these vehicles to develop strategies to try to curtail the use of rape as a weapon of war in the former Yugoslavia. Some of you may know that Albright championed the appointment of the first woman chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Canadian Justice Louise Arbour. Albright also used her leadership positions to support international prosecution of individuals who committed and directed war crimes against women in Central Europe. Here we see uh, an early Hillary Clinton as first lady um, speaking at the Beijing Women's uh, Conference in 1995. When she became Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton elevated priorities related to women to the forefront of US foreign policy. As part of her larger view, that international security was integrally related to women's security. And that, of course, builds on her uh, women's rights or human rights argument articulated in 1995. Clinton highlighted issues of gender and local economic development, for example. And she faced criticism for this. I draw your attention to media accounts of a trip she took as Secretary of State in 2009 to South Africa. She spent twice as long at a women's housing project near Cape Town as she did with the president of South Africa. Women's groups applauded her decision to allocate her time that way, but many official journalists were appalled. So these records of Albright and Clinton can be neatly juxtaposed with those of the two Republican appointees. And here we see Albright with Kirkpatrick. Uh, both of them, I should point out, were political science professors at Georgetown University. And in fact, all these women have academic backgrounds. Hillary Clinton. Uh, was early on a law professor at the University of Arkansas. Um, and of course, Condoleezza Rice, Rice was a political science professor uh, at Stanford and, and later the Provost. So if we look at the Republican appointees, we know that as a political scientist, Jean Kirkpatrick studied women's participation. She was a path-breaking scholar in the 1970s in that field. And she portrayed in her research the efforts of feminists like Bella Abzug and others she portrayed their efforts as illegitimate and unwelcome in their attempts to impose social movement demands on the Democratic Party. Later in her career, Kirkpatrick was the senior woman decision maker in the US cabinet when President Reagan announced what we know as the Mexico City policy. And that, of course, denies American aid to countries and non-governmental organizations that perform or promote abortion services under any circumstances anywhere in the world. And that Mexico City policy was later reversed by the Clinton administration, only to be, be reintroduced uh, by George W. Bush at the start of his term as president. Now, like President Bush and, and First Lady Laura Bush, Condoleezza Rice referred frequently after the attacks of 9-11 uh, to the need for American intervention in Afghanistan in order to protect the rights of women and girls 
living under the Taliban. Yet Rice was a firm individualist, and she rejected group, or what she called, victim responses to discrimination. And that's clearly outlined in both volumes of her memoirs. And she rejected that um, uh, victim uh, approach, whether uh, discrimination was based on race or sex or age or any other category. Rice believes firmly that hard work and study and faith offer the keys to forging ahead, and that they matter more for personal advancement than what she views as the rigid rules and procedures associated with affirmative action. In short then, Kirkpatrick and Rice were influential members of Republican administrations that rolled back women's reproductive rights at the international level and that opposed feminist and civil rights claims in domestic public policy. Now the conventional gender politics literature would characterize both Kirkpatrick and Rice as failed substantive representatives in the sense that they did not act for women as a group according to the terms of either progressive feminism inside the United States or transnational feminism on the global stage. And by contrast, this traditional reading would present Albright and Clinton as substantively representing or acting for uh, women as a group. Now, an alternative reading suggests that all these four leaders carried forward women's interests, but that the two Democrats operated in ways that were more consistent with the preferences of left of center feminism. By contrast, the Republican appointees projected views about women as a group that resonated closely with the public constituency of the Republican Party. That is, far more traditionalist views with respect to issues like the role of organized feminism in politics, or reproductive rights, or affirmative action. Now, if we strip ourselves of this prevailing construct uh, that views individuals who prove unable or unwilling to promote progressive feminist positions as weak substantive representatives, then we create the possibility for a revised approach that opens up a more inclusive understanding of the dynamics of political responsiveness. That is, we might admit the possibility that conservative elites who hold moderately feminist or even anti-feminist views may be acting for different but equally legitimate interests as their left counterparts. So I will end here, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Who would like to start us off? Yes, please. Thank you uh, for, your, for your talk. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit uh, a little bit confused. Okay. In the sense that uh, those uh, women leaders in uh, in US, uh, at least at one time, they are focusing on uh, female rights, on uh, reproduction rights, and at the same time. When you see the story of the U.S. during those female leaders, they have caused many problems to females. Uh, you took long time in uh, their uh, foreign policy in Europe, in Middle East. Uh, I don't know if you missed, I didn't read your book yet, if you missed uh, uh, what happened, for example, in southern part, in Africa, for example. Uh, I can give you the example during those uh, 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 last females, except the first one, uh, they have caused many problems in Africa, especially for women. I can give you the example, the Rwanda genocide. So the secretary, uh, the leader in the U.S. in this foreign policy was a female when she let 100 days uh, for men in uh, Rwanda to genocide, to kill people, and most of the team were female and children. And then at the same time, when you see Madeleine Albright, she was the one actually gave uh, access to Rwanda government to enter the Democratic Republic of Congo. And as you know, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, 42 women are raped every hour till now. And this is the report from Chicago University. You can check it. 43 women are raped every one hour. So, and uh, when you go to Sudan, it's the same. So those three conflicts in Rwanda, in Sudan, in Congo, uh, they, they happened because those females 
agree, gave the go. So uh, I don't know what do you think about uh, uh, those kind of uh, foreign policy because even though there are leaders, I think the U.S. foreign policy is uh, driven by the intelligence. My proposition, for example, is that why not to have a leader female, for example, in the U.S., and to have a leader female in the U.S. intelligence? Because their foreign policy are always driven by the intelligence. What to do? Can I ask a question, which I can to address? Yes. Sure, thank you. Uh, so my, uh, my book and my talk are really not uh, targeted at a defense of U.S. foreign policy. I'm, I'm asking questions about the characteristics of, of women leaders with reference to our comparative politics and international relations literature about, about women leaders. Um, I think in my book I, I certainly give uh, attention to the background uh, to the Clinton administration decisions uh, on Rwanda. If you look at Clinton's memoirs, if you look at Albright's memoirs, uh, they talk about the failure to intervene in Rwanda as the most regrettable, abysmal failure of, uh, of that entire eight-year uh, time in power. Right? So I'm, uh, I, it, it's possible to read their, uh, their memoirs and get some sense of how they failed. Right? And a great deal of the background that Clinton and Albright and others give to that failure in uh, Rwanda in particular is related to what happened not that far away from an American perspective uh, in the same period, which was in Somalia. Right? So we know that uh, in Somalia uh, there were um, uh, you know, decisions made or stumbles made and the lack of intelligence and the lack of coordination, all the rest. Um, but anyone who saw that film, Black Hawk Down, has an idea about what was seen as a major um, crisis uh, of leadership, and in particular, an impression if you read the accounts of early Clinton administration foreign policy. When I should point out that Albright was UN ambassador, Warren Christopher was the Secretary of State at that time. Uh, and so, critics, uh, including many who are sympathetic to uh, sort of democratic party multilateralism on the world stage, um, argue that the early Clinton administration, the first administration after uh, he's sworn in in 1993, is extremely inchoate, waffling, and indecisive, and ends up just um, really um, uh, depleting American uh, prestige and standing around the world and not understanding anything um, about the dynamics of intervention and that Somalia was a crucial failure um, that involved, according to critics, too much intervention. Rwanda was a crucial failure that involved insufficient uh, attention and intervention. And so, um, just to go back to my larger point here, I'm looking at the question in terms of Albright is, for people who argue that the Clinton administration eventually got back on the tracks, one can argue that most analysts argue that the Clinton administration got back on the tracks with respect to the Balkans, with, with respect to Central Europe. And although Albright is not widely credited, one, one part of my book looks closely at how much these women decision makers are credited for the major foreign policy decisions of their respective president, right? And as in early diplomatic history, if you look at histories dating back to the early modern era, women diplomats are generally ignored or under-reported, under-acknowledged, right? Uh, Jean Kirkpatrick is actually not even mentioned in some of the memoirs of some of Reagan's cabinet members, including some people who were supposedly her closest allies in cabinet. So Kirkpatrick is often ignored. Albright is often um, uh, criticized and, and not necessarily in all the accounts given credit for the fact that she was the in-house expert on the Balkans. And I'm not here again to talk about the uh, 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 brilliance or lack of brilliance of, of Clinton or foreign policy, but the fact that they actually did make some decisions on Bosnia and Kosovo, most analysts attribute to the fact that that was the uh, region of the world from which Albright uh, grew. She, after all, was born in Prague. Uh, her father um, had been the uh, Czech press attaché in Yugoslavia at the time she was born. She was a refugee twice by the time she was 11 because of Nazi invasion of Central Europe and then the communist takeover of the post-war Czech government. 
So the point is, she knew a great deal about um, Central Europe, and indeed her father, with whom she was very close, her main mentor, um, wrote a book about Tito's Yugoslavia, where he, he, um, uh, he lamented the fact that after the death of Tito, that tremendous ethnic uh, tension was likely to result, and he questioned whether Yugoslavia would hold together, or how well it would hold together after the death of Tito. So my point here is that to the extent that the Clinton administration actually got itself on the tracks and made some clear decisions, a lot of it was related to the Balkans, to a, an area that Albright knew well, and some of their major missteps are considered to have occurred in Africa, where uh, you know she was not the top foreign policy decision maker in his first administration. Moreover, it was not an area uh, of, of her expertise. Questions? Yes. Um, thank you. It's incredibly interesting. I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of how these four women improved, <coughs> improved or had no impact on the popularity of the governments and the presidencies of the day. Because one conclusion in feminist urban theory and feminist political discourse is that while women are not usually the number one spot, uh, the top job, that in their supporting roles, people find them incredibly popular, and they love Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State, and they imagine her being president. And I'm wondering how these women may have affected the popularity of those presidencies, while well, maybe not getting credit in the biographies later. Mm -hmm. um, just your thoughts on that. Sure. So uh, many of the data about uh, these women uh, suggest that, um, unlike some of our conceptions about, you know, women as uh, less than assertive leaders or less than articulate speakers, uh, these women were very bold public speakers, right? So Jean Kirkpatrick, for those of you who uh, uh, may be interested in uh, in her ideas, I mean, if you want to see some of the sharpest prose in the English language. I would suggest reading Dictatorships and Double Standards because it's a very, very pointed uh, critique of the Carter years, in particular and the failure of, of capital D democratic foreign policy in the Carter years. So Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Clinton do have an important set of commonalities in that each of them believed that the American public needed to know more about international affairs. And they were foreign policy leaders who spent a lot of time speaking out there in the American heartland. They weren't just in Washington or New York or wherever they might have had meetings. Um, they were actually on the lecture circuit trying to tell Americans, you know, in, in uh, Kirkpatrick's case, how the United Nations could be reformed. Why, if the U.S. pressured the U.N. to reform, it would be worth remaining a member of that organization. Um, Albright. Uh, in particular, you can see her wearing one of her, her famous pins. Uh, she had a series of, uh, of pins or brooches that she wore to try and help to explain the issues of the day, particularly to Americans. Right. So here she is. Uh, she's commenting, and she wrote a book called Read My Pins, by the way, that talks about how she uses her pins to explain foreign policy concepts. Here she is uh, talking about, I think this is wearing her famous bluebird pin, and the pin is the bird is pointing downward, uh, because this was commenting on uh, Cuban MiG fighter jet pilots who had shot down uh, an unarmed uh, civilian aircraft over international waters, uh, leading to the deaths of those on board. And Albright was extremely um, outspoken in her criticism of the fighter jet pilots, and she actually played a recording of their um, MiG uh, you know, uh, discuss conversations um, where they use the term cojones, uh, talking about cojones and how they they shot down this other this other uh, plane. And so Albright, in what Bill Clinton said was the most widely quoted statement of his entire time as president, uh, she said that, that that they didn't demonstrate cojones; they demonstrated cowardice. Right. So she she was the master of very very sharp pointed comments. Uh, which were considered to be extremely not in keeping with the ideas of sort of deferential, uh, typically feminine behavior. Uh, Condoleezza Rice certainly was um, a very um, direct, 
and um, outspoken, outspoken uh, advocate uh, for Bush era foreign policies. And I argue in the book that in each of these cases, these women had a long history of being outspoken uh, and in, in, in uh, sort of taking uh, tough positions and insisting that we're going to defend them and not, not being uh, terribly compromising. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Rice was a political science professor. She became the youngest uh, provost in Stanford University's history, the first woman and the first African American. And while she was in that job, uh, she actually cut a series of um, positions, including the, uh, the affirmative action officer who had helped in her appointment as a political science professor. And uh, when students protested, uh, she said something along the lines, you know, they camped out. And she said, well, hell can freeze over before I'm going to change my mind. And she was very, very definitive in her, in her commitment to um, strong positions and to communicating clearly. She wasn't someone who waffled. Um, and in the case of Hillary Clinton, we know that while her speech from 1995 about women's rights as human rights might seem kind of trite in the context of 2018, it was a very um, controversial speech uh, to be made at a UN women's conference by a first lady who's representing uh, a major uh, global superpower at that time. Uh, so certainly uh, Clinton's advocacy uh, as uh, Secretary of State for women and girls, for girls' education, for microcredit in the global south is one. I would say that these women were extremely high profile I'm not suggesting their decisions were necessarily popular, right? Because if we go back to uh, uh, to Rice uh, and the uh, invasion of Iraq, I'm not suggesting that there weren't, you know, there weren't a lot of criticism. But she was certainly someone that the administration put front and center in a lot of uh, context because she could be so so pointed. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, there's a distinction that was made in the presentation Really closer to the end, where um, it was mentioned that it, there's a there's an active question as to whether or not um, people like Condoleezza Rice or Kirkpatrick can be seen as quote unquote failures for representatives of feminist movements, whereas people like Clinton or Albright are more representative of um, progressive feminist movements. Um, and one particular case that's cited is the fact that. Um, I believe it was Miss Kirkpatrick who stated that uh, they should reward even anti-democratic military regimes who are fighting the Soviets, such as Pinochet's regime in Chile. Um, is there not a little bit of distance here in the fact that, particularly in the case of Miss Clinton, uh, she was advocating, like she was advocating that there was a increasing consensus within the Gulf region, which is which have. Uh, very repressive policies in of themselves. That even if it's if it's consensus based upon more repressive regimes, especially with regards to women's rights, is this not in it, in of itself an example of double standards or perhaps hypocrisy between the two? Whereas, yes, they're building consensus, but they're building consensus on uh, grounds that are very repressive to women's rights. Well, I, you know, I want to be clear here as I respond to the first question. Right? I'm not here to defend these particular policies, but to analyze these women's track records, right? And, and when you raise the Gulf Cooperation Council, it's worth, I always point out to my students, have a look at this photograph, the images here, Clinton in this room, and then let's have a look at this room, all right? So the White House Situation Room has men who are dressed differently than those in the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, but Clinton is the only decision maker in both of those rooms, right? So we have to be careful about this notion that you know it, it's it's you know there's, there's somehow an easier um, easier role for her to have influence in the White House Situation Room than in the Gulf Cooperation Council. In other words, these women are facing challenges as often the only woman in the room, whether they're in Qatar or they're in the basement of the White House, right? Um, this question about what is a feminist representative, we know there are many, many feminisms. And we know today, for example, if we watch uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee and the demonstrations outside it, we know that there are large numbers of women who voted for President Trump, who are supporting uh, the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh, right? If we look at the data on um, the, uh, for example, the election of, um, of Ronald Reagan, 
Uh, we know that there was the beginning of a gender gap in U.S. Uh, public opinion, but that large numbers of women voted for Reagan, right? And we know that for something like 41 percent of American women voted for uh, for Trump, and it was something like 54 percent of white women, right? 52, 52, 52 percent. Okay, so it's more than a majority. So my point is here: there are many differing interpretations of women's rights. There are many differing interpretations of feminism. There are many differing interpretations of American interests. Um, but uh, I should point out that an organization uh, known as the Fund for the Feminist Majority that was run by Eleanor Smeal, a former president of the National Organization for Women, um, was one of the organizations that was prepared to come out in favor of the, uh, some of the Bush administration plans in Afghanistan and Iraq. So in other words, it, it, I'm, I'm trying in this book to get away from the idea that there are you know, single avenues by which decision makers can represent, and particularly at the political executive level in the U.S. where these cabinet members are not elected. They're drawn from a huge pool of U.S. citizens living anywhere in the world. Um, many of them are representing constituencies that are helpful. After all, it was helpful for President Bush to have an African-American young woman standing next to him, given that the rest of his cabinet was mostly older white guys, right? It was helpful for President Reagan. He was facing a lot of criticism. Jean Carpenter was the only woman in his cabinet. But she had, you know, what, what did they say? She, she um, was um, pulling above her weight. I mean, she had a, an enormous profile, often eclipsing that of men whose formal positions were more powerful than hers. So the point is that there's lots of in interpretations, and I agree with you that there's lots of points of contention. And U.S. feminism itself is far from homogeneous. Hey, Professor Shaw. Um, thank you for this. What I really enjoyed about it is, you know, as an international religion scholar, you know, the state has traditionally been seen as this kind of unitary actor, and the move often, not exclusively by kind of feminist scholarship, is to move away from the state, and therefore draw attention to dynamics of power, not focus on the kitchens of power. And so what I really liked about your book is you kind of stayed within the the kind of conventional structures of power and then, you know, outline specific kind of gender, uh, de uh, gender kinds of analysis that we can do in that space. Um, I guess I have a question more about the kind of circumstances that the different leaders face. So, you know, to what extent can you explain what they did in terms of the kinds of uh, situations they faced? Right? To me, it's not surprising that they were bellicose, they were national, they were secretaries of state faced with, in a, in a system where the use of force was legitimated, so that choice isn't different. What's interesting is the choices they made, but how much of that is explained by the fact that, you know, Jean Kirkpatrick was in the Cold War, Condoleezza Rice was in a post-9-11 context, um, Madeleine Albright was faced with a kind of you know, fall of the Soviet Union in which, you know, the baffling of the Clinton regime can be based, can in part be explained by, you know, the nature of conflict is changing to some extent. And then Clinton equally faced with, you know, a different set of circumstances in Libya. So that's my first question. Like, do you have information on what the others said they might have done in those circumstances and might have done differently? The other is, how do you explain Clinton and uh, the U.S. program on foreign strikes? Does that, to me, suggest a more unilateral uh, kind of approach to force that doesn't fit with the findings, the multilateral findings? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so in the book, I, I offer a series of what-if questions, kind of thought experiments. Imagine if these women hadn't been in these positions at these pivotal times, right? So. Uh, if we imagine um, Reagan's administration absent Kirkpatrick, his doctrine of his first term would not have existed. She's, she's the one who articulates what becomes the Reagan doctrine in that 1979 article in Commentary Magazine. I mean, it, it would have been, uh, you know, what it often is, a bunch of guys kind of jockeying for position in the president's ear. She's the one who had the vision. She was, after all, a capital D Democrat who become disgruntled with President Carter. Um, and so my what if question uh, 
uh, in Kirkpatrick's case, it's kind of easy to answer because after she serves about you know, a full term plus for Reagan at the UN, and she makes it clear she'd like a promotion, she'd like to become National Security Advisor or Secretary of State, a series of men, including George Shultz, block her mobility. And so she, uh, Reagan offers her another job, but it's not clear it's going to have any influence, so she goes back to Georgetown and the American Enterprise Institute, and we know what happened. Reagan's second term is all about uh, detente and all kinds of um, getting along nicely with uh, the Soviet Union. So in her absence, foreign policy deeply changes. Uh, Nancy Reagan is also considered to have been somebody who blocked Kirkpatrick's uh, promotion. Right? If we consider the what if question here with, uh, with, with Rice, I asked the what if question, what if Rice had not been uh, available to tutor George W. Bush on the campaign trail? She was recruited by his father, George H.W. Bush, who understood that his son was a Texas governor who did not have a lot of foreign affairs knowledge. And I would argue, and I do in the book, that you know, without Rice's tutoring and intensive management of his foreign policy uh, outlook, he would certainly not have succeeded as he did in winning a debate effectively, according to most observers, against Al Gore, a man who had been vice president, privy to every uh, cabinet discussion of foreign policy in the entire Clinton administration, and a very, very experienced uh, student of foreign affairs, including um, not just climate change, but also uh, uh, you know, arms control and all kinds of specialized topics that a governor of Texas would ever need to know about. Right? Um, and that uh, Rice was the one who articulated that preemption doctrine, which of course Colin Powell presented at the UN, that won a lot of people, particularly a lot of Americans, over to the side of intervening uh, in Iraq. So these kinds of thought experiments, uh, I, I argue that without Albright, the uh, Clinton administration would probably have continued to flounder, as it had floundered early in his first term when Warren Christopher was Secretary of State. Floundered from disaster in Somalia to disaster in Iran to do all kinds of other disasters. And she really gets it um, much more focused. Um, and in the case of Hillary Clinton, I argue that it's unlikely the U.S. would have intervened in Libya. Um, and moreover, in Clinton's case, she offered Obama, according to her memoir, certain uh, bits of advice that he did not follow, and I argue that they had severe consequences. She urged Obama not to insist that uh, President Mubarak be removed from office immediately. She suggested that would lead to the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and not be good for U.S. interests. And she offered a uh, defense of better, um, uh, see, more focused U.S. intervention in Syria. Um, and, long before uh, things deteriorate to the point that we see now. So I argue uh, through a series of these thought experiments that imagining their absence provides us with a very, very different view of how these administrations would have operated, that many of the most transformational decisions of those administrations are directly linked to the women who are often ignored in the official accounts of, uh, of the administrations. Finally, your question about Clinton and drone strikes. Uh, you know, President Obama is considered to have been a president who was very much in charge of his own foreign policy. The Hillary Clinton was an advisor, some critics say, but she was she, she had less autonomy than other uh, secretaries of state. And on the drone strikes, we'll see when Obama's memoirs come out, but many people argue that he believed that drone strikes were a way to limit casualties and uh, PTSD and trauma and other, other um, results of uh, of engaging large numbers of African American and other minority men in ground wars, right? So he had a, people argue he had a particular take on the consequences of uh, you know uh, particularly young men from disadvantaged communities in the U.S. finding their best option in the military and then winding up either deceased or or maimed, mm -hmm. and what the consequences would be. So it's not clear that Clinton herself was very big on the drone strike. That might have more been Obama. We'll know more when we see his memoirs. Are there any more questions? We have time for probably one more. Yes? Another question? Yeah, unless somebody else. Unless someone else? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. There's, um, it's completely clear why you picked these four women to study and the fact that their terms are done and, and you can really do that to the analysis. I'm wondering if you have any commentary on the theories that you've, that you've made about these women, if there's anything that can be attributed to the other female leaders that we've seen in terms of ambassadors to the UN, um, obviously Nikki Haley right now, but before that, Samantha Power, Susan Rice is there, 
is there a pattern there? Um, or would you say that you would draw the line between the conclusions that you've made with these women and that there is a different type of leadership that you see being represented there? I mean, and maybe you didn't have a chance to study them, obviously, as intensely as these men. Thank you. I mean, I speculate on this question in the book. Okay. I, I suggest that maybe sometimes the pioneers are different from those who come later. Right? I'm, I don't know um, what we're going to conclude about Nikki Haley's influence on Trump in reform policy. Right? It's very, it's very, very difficult to know because the drivers of policy making in the Trump White House are very different from what's traditionally been the case. You know, say what you want about um, um, you know Reagan or Clinton or Bush or Obama, um, they appear to be more orderly organizations. Although Clinton's administration was considered to be a bit scattered, right? He wrote speeches uh, at the last minute, and a lot of stuff was a, a, a bit last minute. But certainly the chaos quotient will probably be highest in the, in the current Trump White House. And so it's, you know, that's something that historians and, and political scientists will need to bear in mind when they start looking at whose fingerprints were on what. Maybe Nikki Haley's played an important role in stopping certain things. We don't know, right? Because so much of what we hear is now anonymous. Um, Samantha Power and Susan Rice uh, are important because to go back to this um, uh, case in the Obama years, it was Power and Rice who sided with Clinton on uh, the Libya intervention uh, that gave uh, Clinton uh, support that these other women did not have access to. There were no other women in the foreign policy inner circle uh, for Kirkpatrick or Albright or Rice. Um, so certainly Power and Rice uh, Power and Susan Rice uh, were supporting Hillary Clinton on this uh, Libya invasion, but of course I point out in the book there's a lot of a lot of uh, debate about the wisdom of that intervention. After all, you know critics point to the fact that the newly installed government in Libya uh, legalized polygamy as one of its first acts after the removal of Gaddafi. So, what does that say about where women's rights were in uh, post-Gaddafi Libya? Um, how about the questions of the consequences of social chaos and the rise of, shall we say, uh, territorial militias um, and, 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 what the, and the breakdown of a central state? What does that say about the lives of women in Libya since 2011? And so there's certainly a lot of debate about the extent to which uh, there was follow through by the U.S. and its allies uh, after um, the fall of, of Gaddafi. So, it's, I think it's too early to, to know much about these three, but there's certainly, uh, you know, to go back to the first question, there's certainly a lot of evidence that we need to look at whether the rhetoric about supporting the lives of women and girls in the rest of the world, whether that actually plays out in reality in any of these interventions, whether it's in Central Europe or Libya or Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, and also in terms of Jean Kirkpatrick, it's clear that she wasn't necessarily on board with that Mexico City policy. She seemed uh, in her own politics to be pro-equal rights amendment, Reagan was against. She was not in favor of a constitutional ban on abortion. Um, and so, you know, why didn't she do something? Maybe, maybe Reagan needed some seeming moderates in his cabinet and she was, she was very useful. She didn't stop bad things according to pro-choice interests from happening. Um, but it's possible, it seems to me, to open up this field a great deal and ask more about newer appointees like Nikki Haley, Simone Powell, Susan Rice, and, right? and also more more about these because, after all, as one scholar, I can only I can only ask so many questions. <laughs> I have a quick, quick question if I may. Um, I wonder, in the sort of working out of the book, and I think this is something that a lot of us encounter, uh, we sort of go in with uh, an interest in sort of working away from reproducing particular assumptions and stereotypes. And sometimes you talk about, a few times you talk about muscular policies. And that's a pretty loaded gender kind of term. I just wanted to, like, what what do you sort of mean by that? I'm not saying that only guys are muscular, of course, but that when you, when, what I hear when you say muscular policy sounds highly masculine. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I'm sure that's not your intention, but can you say a little bit more about what sure. that means? I mean, I, I, I very consciously use the term masculine because I'm juxtaposing it with the peaceful souls idea, mm -hmm. right? So the peaceful souls idea would be more about finding compromise. It would be mm -hmm. more about common ground. It would be more about um, seeding ground, mm -hmm. right? 
And this more assertive or aggressive or muscular or bellicose or belligerent, whatever, whatever adjective we, we want to use, is, is very different, it seems to me, uh, from the concern. And I, in fact, I started working on this book because many years ago, I think it was back in 1998, I read an essay by Francis Fukuyama, who's a mm. neoconservative public intellectual in the United States, who, who was very concerned, very concerned that the rise of women in foreign policy positions in, in, the, in the global north um, would really limit the ability of the Western world, as he called it, to, uh, to actually have any influence in global, global politics. Because, he argued, women were likely to give away the store. These are my words, right? That they would be weak and they would be compromising. And then he doesn't note that, you know, Margaret Thatcher didn't quite do that. Um, and maybe if we had more Margaret Thatchers. But I, I think my question was, well, to what extent was Thatcher so different? Um, in terms of you know her willingness uh, you know to take on uh, that defense of the Falkland Islands when her own military advisor said it was impossible to mount a military campaign from the UK that was going to go 8,000 miles or whatever it was to the Falklands to the South Atlantic and defend this um, sort of isolated group of islands uh, with a, you know a lot of sheep and stuff and you know not too many people and not clearly you know the core of, of uh, the old empire so. I guess the, the use of the phrase Musk was to try and really get to this whole point about the defense of interests. And, you know, I argue here, these, these women have come up through professions that have yeah. schooled them in national interests and schooled them in powerful public speaking. And, um, I, you know, I think it's inspiring that you know, Academic freedom. all four all <laughs> of them uh, came out of university environments because, of course, for women in the U.S., particularly Kirkpatrick, who's um, uh, who was attending university in the 1950s, um, it would have been very difficult for her to reach a senior position in the military. And often their, their conflicts are with military, uh, you know, like four-star generals in a cabinet. And so they have to kind of marshal a certain presence, and I think it's verbally very forceful, right? And muscular is a, you know, it's a contentious word, but I think it's to draw attention to the fact that they did have a transformative impact on foreign policy in these administrations, often ignored, but I'm, I'm trying here to sort of um, uh, re-inject uh, you know, their presence in the face of what I think is a pretty historic erasure. Are there any more questions? Well, on behalf of the Center for International Policy Studies, uh, Dr. Rush, I can thank you very, very much for And the book, the flyers are here, so you can get a Yes, 30% of, yes. <laughs> oh, sir, sure, yeah.